Our next speaker is Ayele Terez from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Ayele, here. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Can you hear me? So, uh, in my lab, we focus on uh, metabolism and we try to identify unique changes that we can use for either um, uh, diagnosis or for therapy. And I will tell you an evolving story that's been going on in my lab for the last um, six or seven years now. So first, to bring us all to the same page on metabolism, we have to discuss some uh, basic principles of metabolism. So as you can see from this uh, famous uh, slide taken from the Stryer book, metabolism is a dynamic network. It means that everything is connected. What you can also see is that there is order in this uh, network. There's some pathway that relate to anabolism, to growth, like synthesis of nucleic acids, amino acids, lipids, and there are some pathways that relate to waste. But the important thing is whatever you're working on, metabolism plays a role in it, even if it's normal physiology or if you're studying specific diseases. The other uh, principle is that there is always a balance between um, the growth pathways and those that we use to discard um, toxic accumulations of waste metabolites. So for example, if we look at nitrogen and it's our building blocks, it can be used for the buildup of nucleotides, proteins, but the excess nitrogen is secreted in the body by the urine, uh, by the synthesis of urea. Actually, this is why the urine is called um, urine, because of um, the urea. And when we have disease, there is a change in this balance, and so the body reaches a new homeostasis. The third principle is that almost in every disease we have a unique metabolism and here I'm showing you the unique metabolism of cancer that even though uh, by oxidative phosphorylation we get much more ATP compared to glycolysis, in cancer we have specific metabolic rewiring that we get increase in glycolysis, increase in glutamine utilization so that we can support the side chains of glycolysis as you can see here like the pentose phosphate pathway or this for the synthesis of the DNA and RNA. So we have increase in glycolysis not just for the energy because that uh, is much less efficient but in order to support all these branching um, side chains. So, not surprisingly, in the famous um, review of the hallmark of cancer, um, cancer metabolism was added as one of the new and specific um, um, parameters by which we can uh, describe cancer and differentiate it from normal cells and normal tissues. And it took almost a hundred years since Warburg described these metabolic changes that I showed you that occur in cancer until it was used for diagnosis. Here you can see a PET-CT and the tumor is highlighted by the increased uptake of glucose due to the increase in glycolysis that I showed you. So, of course, we're hoping that whatever we work on today will not take a hundred years to translate into therapy. So the way we measure these metabolic changes is basically divided into um, either looking at a steady state, like a snapshot, what's going on now, and we measure the actual levels of the metabolites, or we can look at the flux. You can compare it to looking at how many cars do we now have in the parking lot, or do we want to know how many cars enter and exit the parking lot, which gives us the flux. So. We can look at the genomics, transcriptomics that characterize the phenotype, proteomics, metabolomics. We also add a layer of this fluxomic that gives us almost the bottom, the end product that actually performs the function in the cells. How do we do this flux? We label metabolites. For example, I'm showing you here how we label the carbons of glutamine and glutamate. It enters the cycle, in this case the TCA cycle, and it changes the mass because now each carbon 
uh, mass is 13 instead of 12, and so if we look at aspartate that has four labeled carbon now, the mass would change from M0 to M plus 4, and this is how we are able to identify specific changes that relate to specific metabolic cycles. So, as I told you, in metabolism, everything is connected. It means that also the waste and the anabolism are connected, and the thread that we're using to dissect these changes is by looking at um, a cycle called um, the urea cycle. And what I'm going to tell you today is about a new and rewired connection that we found in cancer by looking at the urea cycle that connects um, nucleotide metabolism with amino acid catabolism by the urea cycle. So what is the urea cycle? The complete urea cycle occurs only in the liver and the main purpose is to detoxify ammonia in multiple steps and generate urea, which as I told you, will be secreted in the urine. Our approach is to look at patients, in this case, that have urea cycle disorders and by looking at them, dissect the changes that these urea cycle enzymes um, uh, cause in cancer. And why do we use this approach? First of all, because it allows us to isolate the specific consequence of a specific genetic abnormalities. Because in cancer, so many changes occur simultaneously. And if we want to isolate the specific changes caused by a specific gene, gene it's very difficult. So it makes much more sense to look at uh, patients that have this specific uh, metabolic change. It, it also has implications if you want to target one of the genes as therapy. It makes sense to look at these kids, what actually happens when you, have, uh, when you don't have this gene functioning. The second reason is that basically what we want to do is to cure humans, right? I mean, everybody cares about mice with cancers, but we care more about human with cancer, and this is our target for therapy. And so it makes sense to also use it as our model when we try to understand the changes that occur in the different um, diseases. So when we look at these patients that have urea cycle disorders and they have a malfunctioning um, um, urea cycle, what happens is that they have elevation in the upstream metabolites leading to uh, hyperammonemia and neurotoxicity. And so in order to prevent that, we treat them with ammonia scavengers that divert ammonia away from the cycle, and we also supplement them with what they're missing, in this case, for example, with arginine, because of the block downstream to the enzyme that is not functioning. And when everything fails, these uh, poor children go through liver transplant. So I don't want to make you experts on the urea cycle, but I want to convince you that these kids are very, very sick. And so the first enzyme that um, uh, we started working on was called, is called ASS1. And it was very surprising to me because I also um, work as a uh, geneticist uh, taking care of this children. It was very surprising to me that papers started to come out showing that in multiple and very, very different types of cancers, you can see here melanoma, liver cancer, pancreatic cancers, ASS1, as you can see, um, in the normal compared to the tumor, it is um, in, uh, in silenced. And so we first wanted to see that it has implications for therapy, and indeed several papers started to come out showing that in those patients that in their tumors, ASS1 is silenced usually by promoter methylation, they have worse prognosis. They die earlier and they have much more metastasis. And so it was very intriguing to me to try to figure out what could be the benefit of ASS silencing in cancer. Because I showed you how detrimental the effect of its loss is on patients um, when there is a germline mutation in normal physiology, it also led us to think that if we identify what exactly loss of ASS1 causes in cancer, maybe it can help us um, come up with a drug that is very specific for cancer and has less effect on other tissues. So, outside the liver, ASS1 participates in a cycle that is meant to generate arginine to supplement the cellular needs for growth because arginine is a nexus for the synthesis of proline, proliamine, and uh, these metabolites are very essential for cell growth. 
And so instead of looking what happens downstream when we, look, when we lose ASS1 function in cancer, we wanted to look upstream. And what we thought is that maybe, as I told you, when we have a block, we're missing the downstream metabolites, but we have accumulation of the upstream metabolites, in this case ASS um, aspartate. And so our hypothesis was that this aspartate is used by a very important bottleneck enzyme called CAD, which is the first enzyme which is crucial for the synthesis of pyrimidine synthesis. And so we thought the benefit that cancer gets from ASS1 silencing is elevation of aspartate that can improve the levels of pyrimidine synthesis for proliferation. Again, it will generate more building block for the cancer uncontrolled um, proliferation. And why did I think uh, it makes sense? Because as I told you before, there is specific rewiring in cancer, and what we thought is that our hypothesis fits right in here, where ASS1 silencing would increase and make available the substrates that are required for us to synthesize DNA and RNA. And so uh, what we did is we silenced ASS in different cancer, and as I told you, with the labeling and the flux, we were able to show that in those cancers with ASS1 silencing, we have higher levels of aspartate. We have more synthesis of pyrimidines, as you can see here by the yellow bars, and we have increased proliferation. The opposite happens when we overexpress ASS1 in cancers. We restrict tumor proliferation, and what was interesting was that we can rescue this um, uh, restricted proliferation, not by supplementing any nucleotide acid, but by supplementing specifically pyrimidines. And this is an important point. So, at the time, we published that ASS loss causes um, this uh, change that benefits cancer proliferation. Another good colleague published that another enzyme in the urea cycle called CPS1 is upregulated to promote the same pathway of pyrimidine synthesis uh, via CAD. And this is because if we look at the uh, pyrimidine ring, aspartate generates it, glutamine generates it, and uh, CP, which is the product of CPS1. But then we thought, instead of just looking at this enzyme or that enzyme, maybe we should look at a specific rewiring of this pathway as a whole not just this or that, but as a whole. And the, the goal would be to increase all these metabolites so that they can be available and channeled for CAD to synthesize more pyrimidines. And so with the help of uh, Eitan Rupin, who the head um, the um, and genome center at the NCI and is also part of the Tel Aviv University, we came up with a UCD score, meaning urea cycle dysregulation in expression that would lead to um, the channeling of the metabolites for CAD. So for example, if we look at CP, which uh, contributes uh, carbon to this uh, ring, CPS1 needs to be elevated in order to generate CP, but OTC, for example, which uses CP, needs to be downregulated. Okay? So we came up with this score that all together uh, would support cancer cell uh, proliferation. And when we started looking at the TCGA um, data set, we were able to see that in very different uh, cancer types, again, we found these um, changes in expression of these urea cycle genes. And we also saw that the higher the urea cycle dysregulation score that we give this cancer, the higher CAD expression that we get, meaning that there is a rationale to our hypothesis. When we zoom in closely, for example, here on the progression from normal melanocytes to metastatic melanoma, we can see that the higher the UCD score, the worse is the stage of this cancer. And again, we were able to show that the higher the UCD score, the worse is the patient's prognosis. So we now wanted to see how does the UCD as a whole, as a pathway, affect carcinogenesis. As I told you, um, we, the UCD, we suspected that it's a very, very specific change in the expression, not just any change, and so we used several cell lines and we induced these specific 
changes. And what we showed uh, is that in all cases, just like when we uh, perturbed uh, ASS specifically, we got increase in cancer cell proliferation. And in all of these cases, it was associated with activation of CAD enzymes, suggesting that it is indeed via the pathway of pyrimidine synthesis. So this was our first conclusion that um, the UCD correlates uh, with increased CAD activity and proliferation. But we next wanted to see whether this increase in pyrimidine synthesis also generates nucleotide imbalance. So it's kind of confusing, but you can remember that pyrimidine is C, U, and T, C, U tomorrow. And at the DNA lab level, every C binds a G, every A binds a T. And so we wanted to see whether this enhancement in pyrimidine synthesis generates a nucleotide imbalance. And indeed, this is what we found in all these cancer lines where we protrubed and induce this specific dysregulation, we perturb the ratio between pyrimidines and purine, and we get higher rates of pyrimidines relative to purine. And so we thought maybe this also generates mutagenesis in addition to cancer proliferation. And indeed, when we sequenced all these cells, we found that when we induced UCD, we found very specific type of mutation, not any mutation, but a specific type, whereas purine is replaced by pyrimidine because of the high abundance. And then we looked at the TCGA database, and again, with the help of Eitan Rupin, we were able to show that at the DNA, RNA, and protein levels, in all these cases, we have when we have high UCD, we have higher level of specific mutation where purine is replaced by pyrimidines. And so it is a very specific genomic signature. So we all heard about immunotherapy and we wanted to see whether our finding in UCD can be relevant to the response of immune therapy. And how does it affect immunotherapy? So a different work by different people showed that when we have uh, higher hydrophobicity, the antigens that are generated are more immunogenic. And surprisingly, when we looked at the amino acid code, we found, and I highlighted here in brown, all the hydrophobic amino acids. When we changed the specific codon that it's crucial to determine which amino acid will be synthesized from purine to pyrimidine, we changed the amino acid to become more hydrophobic. And when we did HLA-bound uh, analysis to the peptides following UCD, we found that indeed these peptides are more hydrophobic. So what I've showed you is that in cancer, there is diversion of nitrogen to support pyrimidine synthesis that supports proliferation and mutagenesis. On one hand, we get worse patient's prognosis, but we get increased response to immunotherapy. So we wanted to see whether these changes are detectable in humans, and as we looked at the other side, because as I told you, there is always balance between the synthesis and the waste. And indeed, when we look at human patients with prostate cancer, we find pyrimidine, high pyrimidine levels in the urine, and when we look at urea levels, and here you can see in the red bar, patients, uh, children diagnosed with cancer on the day of admission, they have low urea levels. And so this supports, again, the second principle I told you about metabolism, that there is always a balance. And we think that this can help us use these UCD changes to monitor uh, cancer progression. So I told you about high pyrimidines generating hydrophobic uh, peptides, improving response to high, uh, ICT. And um, there, is, uh, there are also cancers that have high ASS1 levels, which I'm not going to discuss, but these have high purine levels. And as if you've heard before, we currently have challenges with ICT therapy. First is that um, even those 40% that qualify for therapy, about 20% from the whole population treated respond. And so we have two unmet needs. One is to improve the response rate, and the second to identify biomarkers for the response. So can we use UCD to improve the response to immunotherapy? We first analyzed data sets and we saw that the higher the UCD score, the better response we have to immune therapy. You can see here in the responders in the yellow bar. And so we thought this could support the need for um, 
biomarker, at least help it. But then we thought, okay, those cancers that are cold that we saw to have high purines, maybe by using metabolism, we can convert them to have high pyrimidines and so sensitize them to immunotherapy. And this would answer the um, um, and improve the, uh, the response rate to immune therapy. So we induced UCD in cancer. At first, you can see the tumors grow. But when we treat those cancers with UCD, with immune therapy, we have a dramatic response. And I think it makes more sense when we look mouse by mouse. And you can see that without UCD, sometimes the mouse responds, sometimes it doesn't. But when we give, we induce UCD, there's almost no standard deviation, and all mice respond to immune therapy, and this, of course, associates with increase in infiltration of cytotoxic T cells. So the take-home message that I want to leave you with is that if we understand cancer metabolic addiction, it can be relevant both for its diagnosis and for therapy, and also that we can manipulate tumor metabolism. And then we don't care about this mutation, that mutation. The whole cancer that now survives this metabolic perturbation will now be sensitive to the drug that, uh, that we want to use. So we generate like an Achilles uh, heel that we can now target with uh, this, the therapy that we're interested in. So just want to thank my, my student, my funding, and thank you. <laughs>